Hello, and welcome to Creative by Constantine, where we give you life hacks from music's best. Today, my guest is distinguished pianist and professor at Cleveland Institute of Music, Daniel Shapiro. And we're going to talk about finding your own personal performing style, understanding what makes German music school different than others, piano competitions, of course, and what else? Great practicing tips for all of you who love piano. Daniel, okay. welcome. Thank you very much. It's, it really is an honor to be in this and to speak with you. Well, it's an honor to have you. And, and, and I just have been thinking about the summers at Piano Fest where I was fortunate enough to take your lessons and listen to your uh, wonderful advice, particularly on a specific kind of repertoire. But before we get into that, I wanted to, I always like to begin at the beginning. Do you remember what was the event in your early life that really sparked the music spark? Or do you, or did it happen so early that you don't recall that pivotal moment where you said, I need to be a pianist? Uh, yes and no. The first, what I, the part that I don't remember, but what I was told happened was that when I was six and my brother was eight, my parents bought a piano for him to start lessons. Uh, and I apparently asked me, I take lessons also. I don't know why, but I wanted to. <laughs> so maybe the seed was already planted at the age of six. I don't know. I mean, my parents are music lovers uh, and they've always had music on in the house and, and so forth. But anyway, uh, the, the local teacher said, well, six might be too young, but we'll give it a try. And then after this, the story goes after the second lesson, she could tell that I had the talent and I've never looked back. So that's the part that has been reported back to me. <laughs> yes. And around that age, or maybe when I was a little older, eight or so, uh, my parents have always had a subscription to the LA Phil. I grew up in the LA area. And, uh, I started going every week to hear the LA Phil. And uh, so I started experiencing music live and in particular, the symphonic rep. Uh, and uh, Zubin Mehta was the conductor at the time. He did a lot of Mahler and Bruckner. So I was introduced to all of that at, at a young age. Uh, and, I would, and we had a lot of LPs that I listened to all the time. So it was just a musical household and I don't know that I can remember a moment where I said I want to be a musician, but I don't ever recall a moment where I considered anything else. <laughs> Let's put it that way. It was just kind of always assumed for me. Well, I mean, that's an experience that I share, and, and I think so many of our brethren share also, is that sort of early commitment. Um, have you studied any other instrument or any other musical creative endeavor besides piano? Not really. I took a semester of violin in junior high school and a semester of cello in junior high school. Uh, and I've studied conducting. Uh, and when I was between the years, of, I mean, up until about age 13 or 14, I did some composing. Uh, but, but that's it. It's been only classical music and piano. And, and, and conduct, I've, I've, you know, I've studied and dabbled with conducting my whole life, although not in recent You conducted an opera? I did once, yes. Yes. <laughs> How, was that? How was that experience? That was both phenomen phenomenal and crazy. Uh, it was, if I'll just quit, it was, it was Don Giovanni, and uh, I studied the score like hell, and, uh, and then I was told that... Uh, it was a small orchestra, like, I don't know, a 15 or 20 piece orchestra with not even all the instruments there. So I spent a certain amount of time rescoring things and like, you know, you only had maybe one horn. So I gave the second horn part to the oboe or something like that. I don't remember exactly. Uh, and, and then for the entire opera, we had one orchestra rehearsal, one dress rehearsal for everybody. And then, uh, Two performances. That was it. That's, uh, the whole, that's very little. 
so I learned a lot about, you know, on the fly music making, you know, because at first I was starting to try and coach and say, this should be this way. And, and then I realized I wasn't going to get anywhere near finishing the opera. So I had to just through, you know, through the baton and through whatever I could try and convey as much as what I wanted. And, uh, you know, and so it came out, I mean, in, in hindsight, it was a great experience and it came out okay. And I learned a tremendous amount, uh, but it, it was what it was. <laughs> Look, actually, I, I'm in a very good, positive way envious because John Giovanni happens to be one of my absolutely favorite operas. Yeah. And I, I just sort of know it so well. And it would be kind of a dream project to do something like that. Yeah, <laughs> so incredible. But having done it, would you say that it informed you subsequently in your orchestral performances and in your teaching or, and mentoring of your students who are preparing to play with orchestras? Have you gained something from experience of conducting that you find is really helpful as a, a solo pianist playing with an orchestra? Um. Yes and no. I mean, it, it's a very different animal opera versus, uh, you know, a concerto. And especially, I mean, so often in a concerto, you have more rehearsal time and, and uh, time to, to perhaps meet with the conductor and so on and so forth. Uh, so this was kind of a unique experience. But uh, one does learn that, um, as I say, you know, you know the, the orchestra, there's a certain, I probably even, of course, this was not the Cleveland Orchestra, but most orchestras, there's just by the nature of the beast, because there's dozens of players, there's a certain recalcitrance, you know, they're not going to be as flexible as a, as a pianist might want to be as a soloist. And so one has to have good rhythm and one has to use timing in a way that an orchestra can follow. Uh, and I guess working with an orchestra, whether as a conductor or as a soloist, you realize, uh, you know, that there, there's a way of, of dealing with time taking, whatever that, that is logical and makes sense, and that which doesn't. <laughs> Absolutely true. Amen. <laughs> have you ever conducted and played a concerto at the same time? I have not. I, uh, I think I wish I would like to. Sometimes I wonder. But uh, I was going to say, would you like to do that? I think I would like to at least try it, yeah. I mean, as time goes by, I sort of think about it more and more, and I think I definitely would like to give it a go at some point. Because, I mean, first of all, our very genre of piano concerto began that way. You know, uh, yes. the greats, the Mozarts and the Haydn's, uh, you know, were, and Bach were writing them and playing them and conducting them from the keyboard. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and of course, I mean, I, I wouldn't dream of doing it with Rachmaninoff Paganini or something. But, right. <laughs> but in, in the sort of the birth moment of a piano concerto. That is how it was meant to be. And we have just forgotten that because of evolution of the genre. But it, it, it's kind of, uh, I was always terrified. I said, oh no, that's not for me. But now that I've seen a few of my colleagues do that, uh, it kind of tickles my curiosity. Yes. Yeah, you know, and often, you know, if you work with, you know, some conductors, are even more recalcitrant and, and you, you know, you wish you could be telling the orchestra what the conductor isn't telling them. And so you think, well, why didn't why we just skip the middleman and be able to tell them directly? Yeah, <laughs> the cons direct to consumer business, just like, like most of the internet sales today. Uh, yeah. But it, it actually might be easier. I mean, I don't know. Maybe also, I'm sure it is harder in many ways because there's so many moving parts. Besides yeah, I think it's not as easy as one might assume. <laughs> Uh, but, but it's definitely an experiment worth, worth trying. Um, now, another thing I'm very curious is you were born in Los Angeles, and of course you live in Cleveland. Cleveland is an amazing city, but couldn't be further in every way from LA <laughs> in, in climate and culture. And how did, how did that happen, if you don't mind sharing with us? And, and what was the experience of a change? Or was there any kind of a sense of a shift or were you prepared for that? Well, I came here because I was hired to teach CIM, very simply. Uh, and so uh, I was very grateful and I was delighted to come. And uh, now I, before was, I was teaching at the University of Iowa before I came to, uh, 
a CIM. And uh, so I had five years of Midwestern winters under my belt <laughs> up to then. So it was a little less of a shock because perhaps Cleveland is slightly milder than, than Iowa uh, in, in the winter time. So I had some preparation for that uh, and living in the Midwest. But, uh, you know, I, I mean, what, what's great about Cleveland is not difficult to adapt to. The, the culture and, and the atmosphere of the city uh, was, was just uh, wonderful. So that was not difficult at all. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I learned and gotten to know Cleveland quite well over the years through my experience with piano competition from the yes. 2001. So I, I love Cleveland. Um, and I understand all of the attractions that are there. Uh, it's just the winters are so brutal, you know, uh, I come yeah. from <laughs> Moscow and I think Cleveland winters can rival that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But, uh, you also worked a lot with singers. Yes. Do you still? Uh, I haven't in the last few years, actually myself. Uh, I did work with a singer actually once, uh, about six months ago. Uh, but uh, I haven't done nearly as much as I used to as much as I wish because I obviously dearly love it and I listen to singers all the time, uh, recordings and so forth, opera and everything. Do you, do you find that it really, uh, does it have an impact on you as a, as a pianist, as, a, as an instrumentalist? Um, that, is there something that you find transplantable from the art of singing to the art of playing the instrument? Absolutely. <laughs> I would say it cannot be stressed enough. Uh, the, I mean, after all, what all instruments aspire to do is, is to sing, of course. And, uh, and a singer is, you know, that's in a way the most direct communication, you know, one's own voice. There's no medium, you know. And so that, first of all, there's that, that directness of communication and one can try and get as close to that with the piano as one can. And then just the way a, well, a great singer phrases, the way they express uh, things, uh, I think I've always, you know, held that as a model for how we should phrase and express as a, as a, as a pianist. Uh, and after listening, you know, for hours to so many great singers, whether it's leader singers, you know, Elizabeth Schumann or Fischer Dieskau or whatever, or opera singers, Leonard Warren, you know, you find certain common things. It's just this, this deep human expression, this, this reaching out to, to convey with all one's soul out to the audience in the most sincere, profound way. And that's, I think, the, the fundamental basis of, of what we do. I mean, that obviously that, that's manifested in many different ways. We don't play Beethoven like Verdi, you know, but... Uh, <laughs> well, some do. Yeah, true. Yeah. But, but no, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Look, and to me, it's very evident. I was just earlier today listening to a beautiful sugar G-flat major, um, and uh, the, the singing nature of the line is, is so present there. I mean, you can just hear almost the human voice. Thank you. I mean, that is, is very much a kind of a song without words. Yeah. And, uh, and I do literally sometimes imagine, you know, how would a, a Hans Hutter or a Fischer Dieskau or something like that phrase that, you know, and what kind of expression would they be using? And uh, so when I try to think that way when I, when I play a piece like that. <laughs> I, completely, I work a lot. Uh, with vocalists and, and I always say that I just steal their phrasing you know I, I always imagine almost 100% of the music I play uh, how it would be sung as a vocalese you know mm -hmm. it doesn't have to even have the words but because the, the breath the, the energy and the timing of breaths is what makes the natural phrasing because yeah. you can't overhold it but you know you don't want to underhold it because then you create gasp and, and then everybody's you know kind of breathless Right. Yeah, um, and in the case purpose. of this, I'm, I'm sorry. Unless it's on purpose, right? Like in Mozart's famous stupefaction ensembles, you know, when they're brief in the middle of the word, right? Like at the end of Don't Try. Yes. Yeah. 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 Right. Uh, and I think, 
um, Schubert's that particular or a piece like that, one can almost imagine the kind of subject matter the singer is singing about, perhaps some kind of texts uh, and uh, a slow movement of a Mozart sonata so often is, is like a, a slow aria from one of the operas and one can sometimes imagine the kind of text or the kind of subject matter and, and, and that can be an inspiration as to what kind of expression one wants to, to give out. Oh, absolutely. I always say that in, in slow movements of Mozart concerti and sonatas, that is always that um, opera serie character of, you know, Donna Anna or the Countess that he inserts into almost every one of his comic operas has one very serious and sort of distressed character that seems to be out of place. And it's always that, you know, woman scorned and but beautifully so <laughs> and, and it's always the countess you know with the dova sono dei momenti or something and right. that's the kind of music that he writes but it's if one sees that parallel i think it makes the interpretation so much more accessible to the pianist and therefore of course to the right. audience and usually such an aria it's usually a moment where this the character there's some kind of conflict I am in despair, but I hope. I love, but I hate at the same time. You know, uh, Don Elvira is singing, I, Don Giovanni is so horrible, but yet, you know. And yeah. so one can try to somehow tease out something like that in, in you know, uh, K488 or whatever, 467 or whatever, you know, Absolutely. that kind of thing. No, and, I agree. No. How did you discover your particular musicianship? Uh, I know it's a very general and big question, but when did you feel affinity to the repertoire that you were spending you know, most of your creative time with? I think just it was a matter of uh, what I was brought up doing. I think the, the, both of the first two major teachers that I had stressed a lot of Mozart and Beethoven and Schubert and uh, and so I just was playing that from, a, from an early age. Uh, I did a lot of Chopin when I was much younger. Uh, and then I stopped for a long time. And now I'm starting to, you know, in the last 10 years or so, I'm starting to come back to him. But, uh, but yeah, uh, Beethoven and Mozart, Schubert and Brahms, all that just, I know that was always assigned to me or I always picked it. And, uh, uh, and then, that's kind of how it came to be. Uh, well, I don't think that I just natural uh, symbiosis in your case. It's a two-way road, you know. It, it, clearly, you have a special affinity towards it. Um, do you do you find that in your teaching experience over time is the relationship with that music uh, becoming different uh, with young? pianists with young students is the approaches or general views are they changing or are they pretty much the same i'm happy to say they're changing uh because i mean i do believe that we have to evolve and learn uh and it's been shown time and again by many great people such as leonard bernstein who lectured about this that you learn from teaching uh and i learned a tremendous amount from teaching uh and so as we just go through life and we, we come back to these pieces and we, we find new things about them, you know, the old story, and we uh, just find new awareness and new insight into these pieces. And I hope that I'll continue to learn and grow as I get older. <laughs> of course, of course. But in your students, do you see that there is a kind of a generational switch in, in the attitude? towards the music? Um, I don't know. I mean, I guess, uh, I suppose there is a little emphasis, more emphasis on certain composers and less emphasis on certain composers. Uh, probably, you know, Liszt, Rachmaninoff, Chopin uh, have gotten more common and Schubert, less 
than those. Although Schubert, you know, as we know, was more common than it was, say, 50 years ago. Uh, but uh, generally, especially Schubert uh, tends to not be played as much. And all too often, I think there's in the younger generation, but not just in the younger generation, this idea that, uh, you know, if you play Rock 3 or Gaspar or Prokofiev 3, that's fantastic. And if you happen to play Beethoven okay, then, then all the better. But that's for me a little backwards. I think what's, what's most important is how you play Beethoven. If you can play a great Prokofiev 3, well, that, you know, great, that's great also. <laughs> no, I, I hear you, absolutely. Well, in many ways, there are certain music that is sort of easier to interpret, not to in any way diminish the value and the beauty and uh, awesomeness of Prokofiev III. But I find that Prokofiev is actually one of these composers that um, is generally easy, easier to play really well for many. Mm -hmm because of the very nature of the music it's incredibly rhythmical you know there's a lot of percussive element it also has to have a singing tone and, and all those things of course but somehow it seems to be a, a quicker fix interpretively if you have the chops to do it right yeah. that's of course one big thing <laughs> uh, but with equal chops you know making a, a passionata work and not put everybody to sleep uh, type of thing, you know, is, is much more challenging. Yeah. Do you agree? Well, I agree, but I mean, it's, an, I mean, you know, many times I heard Claude Frank say that everything is equally difficult, whether it's for Elisa or, you know, Passionata or anything in between. And so, I mean, all great art is, is difficult, including Prokofiev and, and whatever else. And one realizes the more one gets into Prokofiev, you know, what's there, and it is just a matter of hacking away at the piano. Uh, more about that in a second. Uh, but uh, but then <laughs> maybe perhaps after working on that, and then you come back to Beethoven, and that's even harder. <laughs> true. Look, like one of my teachers early on said that music is like communism. All notes are equal, but some are more equal than others. Yes. Right. <laughs> Yeah. So it's 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 so it, it's just difficult de facto, uh, but uh, and not to in any way say that Prokofiev is easy to play, but there are, is a certain certain qualities, certain music that I think, give an appearance or at least give an appearance to a young student that it's kind of uh, you know easier grab. You can just sort of do it. And yeah, certain aspects about, certainly. You know, yeah. Absolutely. It's just going to overwhelm the audience and everybody's going to yeah. you know, cheer. <laughs> and, and, and so they do, but, but that, is, that is the nature of the beast. Um, and of course, that is partially uh, encouraged and necessary because of the piano competition scene, right? Because for right. young pianists of today, it's really the only way to kind of get seen and to perform. Uh, professionally, outside of school, for the most part, right? And, and, and everyone is sort of trying to uh, put their best foot forward to impress with every note, with, you know, not a single moment should go uh, wasted on, on something that isn't absolutely unbelievable. And that's yeah. kind of the thinking, I think, behind it. How, what, yeah. what are your thoughts on, on, on that as a teacher, yeah. as a pianist? Well, I mean, I think, you know, the, the downside of that is this, this I guess you'd call it the, the idea of polishing, you know, uh, that for a competition, you have to put layer after layer of polish on a piece so that everything sounds just absolutely perfect and you can, on the drop of a hat, play a piece perfectly. Uh, but I think that in a way detracts from what art is really all about. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and, you know, there, there are so many pianists or competition winners that, that can play with a kind of perfection, but it, 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 something very major is missing, you know, right? I mean, partly because they're young and they're, you know, they're, they're, they have to mature and all that, 
but there's this spontaneity, you know, whatever you want to call it, this risk taking, this freedom, uh, and this, and this depth of feeling uh, that you hear in, you know, the Schnabels or the Fishers or people like that, uh, who who's playing wasn't so perfect. I mean, I'm not only talking about, uh, you know, this notes and obvious things like that, but. Uh, but you know, if you listen to a great recording of a quartet or, or a schnabel, you can find a hundred things wrong, a hundred things to criticize. You know, uh, yes. but what's right is so much more, more important than what's wrong. <laughs> so, you know, you say, well, that uh, maybe I would do that differently, and that and that and that. But my God, what playing! You know, and I'm so inspired by this. You know, and I think that and CDs and recordings have forced us all to worry about this. This perfection and to to gasp in horror and god forbid there should be a wrong note somewhere <laughs> right well that's a whole other thing you know i was recently on a jury of a, a competition and i was amazed at how virtually perfect everyone's unedited you know one single take performances were yeah. technically speaking but uh it, sometimes i felt that, that a lot was sacrificed for that uh, in terms yes. of exactly what you're talking about, the spontaneity or, or, or a sense of uh, wonder, you know, of joy of music making, because it becomes a little bit of a um, Olympic sport. Uh, yes. And people, I think there is an element of, uh, you know, Olympic prowess to it. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, to be able to play the piano at all is already incredible feat for a human being, because we weren't right. by nature designed to do it. Unlike right. singing, which we were born with, all yeah. of us. Uh, not piano playing, for sure. And then, so it's already kind of an incredible physical experience, but then I think the mindset becomes so focused on perfection because we're surrounded by it, you know, with ease that all the editing apps allow you to, just like with the pictures, you know, you can retouch yourself, you can edit yes. yourself. So the, the new norm is this superhuman perfection that yes. everyone is after. And, and I think that, that it can be a two-edged sword because you can sort of lose uh, you know, your personality right. in the moment of retouching yeah. it. Right. And even, I mean, it's, temptation, it's a big temptation for teachers, many of who succumb, I might say, to sort of teach this way, you know, to hear a piece 20 times uh, that the student is preparing for a competition and, you know, fix that and make that just perfect. And the student says that, well, go home and practice that part 50 times, you know, and uh, is the student really learning what music is about when through that kind of, of it's, it's competition preparation and polishing, but it's not really learning about music making. <laughs> <laughs> True. But, but what, it, what for you, who are your sort of, I know it's a corny question, icons? Do you have a pianist, say of the golden era, you know, that aren't no longer with us, of that generation, somebody that, that you just can't explain but love, whatever it is they do? Well, certainly, I mean, I've mentioned Schnabel many times, and I am kind of a creature, I mean, I've, of his, I've studied with, officially with two of his students, Joanna Grad and Leon Fleischer, and I've had coachings or lessons or contact with other students of Schnabel. Uh, so I'm very much in his line of thought and I find his playing to be a great inspiration. Uh, so certainly he. Uh, and uh, the other ones, at least among pianists, and I probably spend more time listening to other things than pianists than pianists, but uh, Schnabel, Horto, Hess, um, Sarkin, uh, Edwin Fisher, uh, those are probably the five, yeah, again, I mean, I don't want to say that those are the five greatest pianists, but those are probably the five that have influenced my development the most. But, but that's so important to, to, and to, to know, identify and, and embrace uh, because we all have, you know, sort of our, um, favorite musicians and favorite pianists since we're, pianists ourselves um, and those are amazing artists and amazing names but yeah. they do share something in common that's sort of Teutonic 
uh, affinity that, of course, you inherited and, and, and uh, continued. I haven't even mentioned Fort Fangler yet, but <laughs> talk about Teutonic. Uh, but but the, the, I mean, the, that is um, so important. You know, I noticed that my, for instance, have sort of changed. I was, I, as a kid, I was obsessed with Horowitz. Mm -hmm. um, and then I kind of refocus my obsession on uh, Rubenstein. Yeah, Rubenstein, absolutely. And Porto, and then I just sort of it kind of fanned out. Now I have lots of super favorite pianists, and I like a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and it just kind of became yeah. <laughs> a la carte. Many of it sounds terrible, but right. it's true. Um, Rubenstein, though, uh, remains kind of in the league of his own, just because of that joy of music making so tangible. Yes in everything he does. Yes. And he played, as we know, unbelievably, and there were recordings that he did not play, you know, forget perfect. I mean, he just messed it all up. But <laughs> there was just such a sense of, I don't know, artistry and, and enjoyment and love for doing it. Yeah, enthusiasm, an aristocratic being, and yet also this poetry and this deep-seated feeling of you know this deep poetry that he had yeah so it kind of lifts to me it lifts uh, across time like i feel it in the room when i listen when i hear him play even if i disagree with everything he does on right. the concept <laughs> but i just smile when i hear him you know yeah. that, that that is an incredible quality to transmit uh, yeah absolutely and um it, when you were in your teaching, do, do you have a lot of your students, uh, you know, preparing for competitions and bringing to you those programs and saying, you know, I need to get ready for that, or or are they just sort of doing their own thing and just working with you on their overall development? There are no. There's a good number that are always saying, I got to do this for this competition and that for that competition, and I try and say, let's not focus too much on that because you're here to learn. And so it's always this, you know, back and forth dance. I'm sure that's true with most students and, and, and most teachers. So we usually try to find a way where we can cover lots of rep, but also find pieces and get them ready for a certain number of, of competitions, certainly. Yeah. Okay. Well, and of course, right now, you know, with COVID-19 having essentially yeah. disrupted the planet and the world right. as we know it, uh, I imagine that you do most of your teaching, all of your teaching on uh, Zoom or other platforms. Yes. Yes. How was that conversion? Have you ever done that before the necessity arrived? No. And it's, uh, you know, it's so, so. It, it, uh, if the student sends me a recording that I can listen to before the lesson, uh, that's better, you know, where I can listen, you know, to a good file with good headphones or whatever, so I can get a clear picture of what they're doing. And then we talk about that in the lesson. But that's already one step removed. We're not dealing with a, an actual thing going on at the moment. Uh, and sometimes, you know, you can get a certain amount done and, and all that. But you, at least so far, I haven't been able to, you know, one can't play with the student while the student is playing. One can't even talk while the student is playing. Uh, a lot of times, if I want the student to... to to stop playing, but they're playing loudly and they can't hear me. You know, I'm saying, oh, okay, okay, and they're still going away for, you know, so it's not the most efficient kind of thing. Uh, but that said, we I think we've gotten some good lessons done that have been been helpful. I think, but yeah, it, yeah it, it's less than ideal, of course. Look, I mean, it's a learning curve for I think for yeah. everybody, but really having no alternative puts us a, a, a very strongly. Uh, in a situation of facing it no matter what and just dealing with it you know i i've been uh i never before really taught online either uh so okay. that i had to kind of rethink it and i still i can't um i find that it takes for a lesson to be sort of complete it just requires more time so everything yes. kind of gets longer do you find that yeah yes i think that's true yeah, somehow every, le every hour lesson ends up being an hour and a half. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's interesting because some of, some of our colleagues have been teaching online long before, 
And for them, it wasn't an adjustment at all. So they just kind of sailed right into the situation. Oh, interesting. Um, and uh, I, I was, I became aware of that when March happened and, and we were all sort of sitting there thinking, how do I do this? Um, yeah. and, and there we were. But um, I also wanted to ask you in your own practicing, do you have um, some, what one would describe as, you know, your favorite secret, your, your key to learning things? Do you do something always that uh, helps you learn faster, memorize better, uh, a kind of uh, get the text into your body? I think the answer is no. <laughs> uh, uh, there's no one way I, I approach things. Uh, and I actually think that ultimately, I'm not sure that learning something quickly is the best way to learn a piece. I think sometimes the slower one absorbs it, the better. Uh, and it's kind of quick in, quick out. Uh, and so with a new piece, I, you know, I start practicing it. I, I try and get to know it also away from the piano. Uh, you know, I'll look at the score and I'll try and think about how it should sound without having to worry about all of the technical you know, issues or whatever. Uh, and, and I'll start to, I get, I guess fairly quick, usually in the process, I start to try to figure out how the pieces put together, just some basic formal things and then you can start getting in more and more detail you know with the pencil out showing you know a curve of what belongs together and this is cell a and that comes back over here you know so you begin to see how, how everything is, is put together that's I, so of, yeah. I think do you do you bring this up with your students because this is yes. not what everybody does a lot and but that is so important yeah absolutely i try to i think i do we have to ask them to be. <laughs> uh, As a compositional double major, you know, I had to do that in my composition class. Mm -hmm. So I, I've just gotten a habit early on of kind of working with the score and analyzing it. Uh, well, because yeah. I had to, but I realized how helpful it is in in, in cognitive process in understanding yeah. music, and I mean it also in my case helps with learning it faster, which not necessarily is the objective, but what, when you know how it's built, you know, you, you exactly. know it, as opposed to discovering it kind of with your, you know, eyes closed. Yeah. But even at that, I mean, I don't want, I don't like getting overly analytical because there has to be, you know, a certain intuitive, just it has to kind of osmose into the system, you know, kind of organically. And, you know, as we know, great art doesn't lend itself to nice, clear dissection, you know. And so I do a lot of, you know, playing all the way through a piece. Regard, I don't care how sloppy it is, just to get a sense of the piece and, and the smell of it and, and uh, the character and, and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's often overlooked. The, the all too common method is people, well, there are two mistakes students make. One is they go to the YouTube and they listen to somebody else. And I've always been on the swore path to say, no, 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 don't listen to any recording, no matter how great the artist, you know, and I try to do that too. I just, you know, the score and the artist and you try and work from the score, you know, you try and develop that relationship. Uh, and then after you've, studied a while, maybe even performed it once, even for a studio class or something, then you can go see what you know, Mr. Serkin does or Sokolov or you know, whoever, you might, whoever it might be. Uh, but uh, so that, that's one thing. And the other thing is people will, you know, learn a piece very slowly, uh, you know, a quarter note equals X. And then after a week, it's X plus two and then X plus four and then X plus six. And they kind of gradually bring it up to speed. And, that seems to me very methodical and formulaic and you, you miss really experiencing the piece that way. As I say, I think one should play through the piece a lot, no matter what kind of a mess it is, uh, just to, then you go back and you figure out. And also often, you know, we realize 
it's not the whole piece that's difficult. It's it's six spots, you know, and then you work on those six spots and then you're ready, you know. Well, that's how the world is. I mean, that's that's the nature of the music. It's never all the same uh, degree of hard, you know, hard, hard, right. hardness, uh, hard yeah. difficulty. It, it is, um, it's the parts, exactly. And once, once you identify them, it's easier. Uh, do you, so I take it you're a sight reader. Uh, yeah, I haven't, I'm lucky for some, I'm, I do sight read well, so uh, I, I guess that helps, but uh, um, it's interesting though, you know, as one gets older, two things happen. Uh, one's technique is not as facile as when, when one is younger, and so one has to work harder for every little detail, but I think if one works in the right way, that really connects one, you know, if one looks at not as technique as, you know, sort of this abstract technique that you superimpose on a piece, but every scale and every piece is its own technical problem and its own challenge and working on that helps you, you know, learn the piece. Um, and uh, what was I going to say? Um, also, one's memory isn't as good as one it used to be. Uh, but I think there's an advantage because a piece that I may have learned a few years ago, I may not remember much anymore. So I have to, in, in a way, almost start from scratch. Uh, and I see it with new eyes and it helps me not rely on old formulas. <laughs> no, right. Uh, you know, that so one has, in many ways, yeah. So one has to turn disadvantages into advantages somehow. <laughs> always, always. Well, you know, I sometimes get a brand new score. For, for music that I return to. Yeah. I don't want to see my marks from two, five, two, ten years ago, because then the habits pop right back in. The moment right. you kind of access that database, you're back to that square one where you were yeah. with the beat. Yeah. yeah. So sometimes it's best not to even see it. I don't throw them out, but I have like duplicates and duplicates of scores that I don't sort of touch for years. Yeah. And along those lines, something that I do for myself and also I say this to my students, uh, even if they've worked on a piece a lot, if, if they have a performance coming up, take a clean score and pretend like they've never seen this, the piece before in their life and sight read through it. Uh, uh, you know, because they, you know, they mark up the score, it looks like it's hemorrhaged with pencil and red and everything else and you can't even see the notes anymore. So then you look at a clean score and you look again at what the composer wrote. <laughs> uh, and it's very refreshing. Uh, and that reminds me of the other thing that I was gonna say in learning a piece of, that helps me learn a piece of music is every single indication of the composer, uh, a slur or a dynamic, one has to ask oneself why. Why did the composer take the ink? Because back then it was difficult and expensive to write something, to write the word C-R-E-S-C down you know or whatever uh you know why is it mark forte why is it mark piano you know but what, what does that mean uh and also what kind of forte and what kind of piano is is required uh and and that gets one thinking in a different kind of way and it gets you into you know right it gets you into the composer's mind i think yeah absolutely um speaking of which it, do you um, what would you say, and again, that I'm putting on the spot, but would you, how would you characterize the most important features of, in performance and interpretation of Mozart versus Schubert versus Beethoven? Uh, well, I guess, I mean, this, I don't mean this to sound dismissive, but, uh, Mozart is Mozart, Schubert is Schubert, Beethoven is Beethoven. And you can't worry when you're playing Beethoven uh, whether it may sound like Mozart or not. It might or it might not. But the point thing is it has to sound like it has to sound. Uh, but maybe a, a, a fair answer to your question is, uh, you know, what, what are the, the different basic approaches to life and music of each of these three composers? Uh, and Mozart and Beethoven, 
I think one, this is, of course, I mean, all generalizations are overgeneralizations and oversimplification. But in a sense, one could say Mozart depicts human beings as they are with their foibles and their hormones and their pettiness. Uh, Beethoven depicts human nature as he wishes it would be. <laughs> so he is more of, I guess you could say, you know, he, he's depicting an idealized, ethicalized world. I was just going to say an idealist. Yeah, okay. And Schubert is kind of the, the man, next, the guy next door off his high horse and loves nature and loves being in nature uh, and responding to it. Uh, and enjoying life. <laughs> That's fair enough. That's very, yeah. I, I think it's just, even talking about it, however general, I think it's, in, these are important um, images to have and important things to think about for everybody who is yeah. playing those composers because they, I find that a lot of the time uh, these three and, and a couple more Get, they just sort of all get clumped together into the German Viennese school of German playing, whatever that means, right. uh, music making, you know, and they're all supposed to be, you know, Sturm und Drang or intense or, uh, and, and then it just sort of sits in that its own compartment without particular distinctions between the two, uh, the three or the four, or however many, uh, right. but they're all such different uh, composers and there's sort of an approach that each one of us finds to be their own to them. Yeah. But it's something we have to think about. You know, it took me, I, I as a child was made to play Mozart and I really didn't like playing Mozart as a kid. And yeah. uh, of course Mozart is now basically my favorite composer. And I remember one of my chamber music teachers said to me, she said, you don't understand this now, and okay, but you know, when you grow up, I think Mozart will be your favorite composer. And I was like, ha, sure. <laughs> like, give me Mephisto. And um, right. yes. she was so right, you know, only 30 years later. I really come to, for me somehow, it's just a place, Mozart and Richard Strauss, you know, are my sort of two gods hmm. that um, never age. You know, some music, I love Rachmaninoff, but sometimes it's sort of heaven up for Rachmaninoff. I love Beethoven, but sometimes I'm not in a zone for that sort of intense uh, mm -hmm. uh, philosophical probing of his, you know. But right, somehow yeah. Mozart and Richard Strauss are always just in the right spot for me. And, yeah. but I it was not like so for me when I was, you know, growing up and a teenager. And, so I wondered if, do you have that kind of a, a composer from your youth that you idolized and loved and that now you kind of slightly moved away from? Um, no, I don't think so. If anything, I think, uh, well, I mean, the closest comes is Chopin I moved away from, but I've kind of found a way back, or at least I think I have, I hope I have. Uh, uh, but I don't think there are any composers I've moved away from. Uh, and there are composers I'm discovering that I hadn't in, in recent life that I didn't as much before. And one of those is Debussy. Uh, I hardly played any Debussy, but now, last few years, I'm just, I think that I have discovered something that connects me to him. Uh, and now I starting to really enjoy playing uh, WC. What are you working on, if you don't mind sharing? Uh, well, I've been on and off learning the first book of Periods. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so that's, that's uh, and, and I try one to, trying to get to know Pelias and Melisande better, uh, which is just amazing, a is that? staggering masterpiece. <laughs> and the course on it, it's so Wagnerian. He was so, Anti Wagner, and yet the score in its structure, the way it's composed, is exactly like essentially the Valkyrie. It's really yeah. incredible, right? How similar it is, and yet how, um, in every way, he was in opposition camp to <laughs> anything Wagner, Wagnerian, or Wagnerite. 
uh, but it's a great opera, Alliance. Uh, I also have this inexplicable um, love for La Pemidi du Pont. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yes. And you know, there's a wonderful two piano uh, version that I played many times on two pianos, you know, with different pianists. It's really. Mm -hmm. There's a one piano thing. version, of course, which is, is which is very good. Yeah. Yeah, I have that too, but I actually never got around to learning it because uh, <laughs> at the time that I got the score, I started making my own transcriptions, and then when I started making my own transcriptions, I was like, stop playing other people's transcriptions of things. I see. Um, right. Yeah. And uh, so, so I know it exists and it's quite good, but I was like, you know, I have to play my own things, but that two piano is a really it's it's a lot of fun to play and it's it's just such a great piece do you play a lot of yes. music? new music yes is that what you said yeah do you play Unfortunately, a lot of new music no i i am guilt guiltily admit that i don't i would like to and uh um i guess the closest to in recent times to anything remotely new as I learned the Schoenberg concerto, uh, but that's not really new. So uh, I'm, I'm rarely I'm, heard always, Yeah, always looking for opportunities. I mean, I guess I'm, I like, you know, I'm trying to find new music that I can relate to, uh, which is not easy, <laughs> obviously. Uh, but I try, obviously, it doesn't mean that it has to sound like Beethoven or Brahms, don't get me wrong. Uh, so, oh, but yeah, I, I, I don't even, I don't even Brahms. Yeah, no, so I hope to uh, encounter new music and, and look more into that. Yeah, look, I mean, the only way to play any music is to connect to it. So that's the number one prerequisite, uh, you know, so... Yeah there is no point in playing something just for the sake of playing it if you don't feel it. For me, it's kind of uh, been a very weird journey because as a composer myself, I even stopped composing for a number of years because I wasn't feeling it. Um, I just mm -hmm. haven't understood what my style of composition naturally should be uh, besides just, you know, education. And then I couldn't find the kind of new music that I responded to until I met a friend and a colleague now, Paulina Nazaikinska, you know, whose music almost exclusively I play, uh, all the new music, and I love her music, but it's, it, it's a very, it was a great and ha wonderful happenstance, you know, it was completely unplanned. Um, so these things happen sometimes if we're fortunate enough to cross paths with the right composer that we get, and then it all makes perfect sense. Yeah. Because it's- yeah. What was the name of that composer that you uh, have just Olga found? Nazikinskaya. She's a Russian-American composer. Uh, she's based in New Haven, in New York. Uh -huh. And um, she writes a lot of music for me. We, and I performed, premiered her a ballet, and we have another one coming next year and we're working on an opera for which I'm writing a libretto and um, wow. she, I just had a second uh, piano single released uh, digitally on a label the other day that she composed for me during the COVID isolation. So, you know, we're very prolific, but it's just the right match. And it took, yeah. you know, however many years to find uh, a living composer with whom one can develop the kind of relationship. So I think it's very important. Uh, to keep that in mind. Yeah. Uh, do, uh, coming back to practicing, do you uh, practice hands separately? What are your thoughts on that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, every which way, and separately. And, and uh, uh, but I mean, not just sort of methodically, you know, left hand, right hand. I'll, I'll you know, I will try to practice certain voices at the same time. Uh, now, you know, just a simple example in a Bach fugue, you know, uh, a, a, an alto or a tenor voice will switch hands. And so if you only practice the left hand, you'll have big holes in what you're doing, you know. 
So I'll practice, you know, voice by voice. And, and, you know, and that's how I would instruct the students to do. Uh, but uh, in a piece that's very, you know, orchestral or layered in nature, you know, I'll practice these elements together, which may have some of both hands and then those other elements and, you know, and that kind of thing. So I practice different layers, which don't always correspond to just left hand or right hand. No, it makes perfect sense. You know, in, in my school in Moscow, we were, that's how they made us practice um, cubes is, is by voices. And then you would have to sing one of them and play the others. No, yeah. Which made for quite a number of, you know, funny moments. And <laughs> if only we had cell phones. Would have been perfect TikTok. Yeah. Uh, but, because um, <laughs> I mean, it was pretty wild. But it does develop your ability to track voices much better if you actually try to sing it and yes. you know, one of them as you play it. Yeah. Um, do and you of course, if, if you were lucky enough, I'm sorry? No, no. I was going to say, if, if lucky enough to, or unlucky enough to have studied with Nadia Boulanger, one would have to transpose fugues and do all kinds of things like this. And I was just yeah. hearing how Robert Levin was uh, exposed to all this kind of thorough grounding of musicianship, and then you really learn how music is put together. <laughs> yes, well, not that we want to, I mean, there was just nobody else like her, for sure. Um, right. how, do you ever practice rhythms? Rhythms? Yeah. Is that what you said? Yeah. Like, uh, yes. Uh, I almost never do dotted rhythms, I have to say. I find that to be a 99%, not 100% of the time, but 98% of the time, a, a waste of time, dotted rhythms. Uh, but if it's a passage in 16th notes, I'll sometimes do groupings, you know, uh, you know, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, four, one, two, three, that kind of thing. Right, 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 right. Uh, yeah. So, and even then groups of eight notes, uh, that kind of thing. So, in certain passage break, yeah, I'll do some uh, groupings. Yeah, so the uh, grouping you're talking about, I think, is is the sort of golden age grouping out of eight notes, three slow, five fast, and then the slow move through the grouping of five fast. Is that correct? Um, well, no, I, I don't know if we're saying the same thing. In other words, if you had, uh, let's say, four eighth notes and four eighth notes and four eighth notes and four eighth notes, and four eighth notes all being together, and you number them, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Okay. Uh -huh. So I will, I won't, I'll start, I'll practice. Uh, and this, this was like what Leon Fleischer hammered us for years and years, not so much in practice, but just literally how music was put together that you would practice two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, or three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, four, one, two, three, uh, so uh, here, I'm, I'm at the piano. So you know, let's say I'm practicing. That's uh, why I practice. Um, you know, that kind of thing. Oh, yeah. Okay. No, that's, so that's, that's what I yeah. that's, that's very useful, actually. And I think it really does work um, beautifully yeah. to even out to sort of gain control of everything. Yeah. Um, but I will rarely practice one, two, three, four, because that, that chops the music up. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, I, I also use the, the ones that have three slow, then five fast, then one slow, five fast, two slow, then two slow, five fast, one slow, and then finally five fast, three slow. I'll have to try that. <laughs> That's a very okay. old, archaic thing that one of my teachers early on told me it's, it requires a great deal of patience to go through this correctly. But if you do, it really helps yeah. with evening out passage work, particularly scales kind of things, you know, not so much arpeggios, mm -hmm. but just even scales. It's really good. Yeah. Do you play I mean, scales? in general, I'm sorry? Do you play scales? Uh, oh, sometimes I do nowadays. Uh, I didn't for years and years, but sometimes uh, I'll I'll warm up with with scales. Not very often, but sometimes uh, I'll go through uh, all twelve keys of you know major or whatever, uh, and just to 
I mean, try to play beautifully and just look at the, the, the mechanics and, and very slowly and carefully. Uh, and, uh, but I would say that, you know, what so many teachers teach young students that the first thing you must always do when you practice is, is play through your whole regimen of scales and arpeggios and all that kind of thing. And to me, I mean, who would want to go to the piano and have to do that? <laughs> Uh, I think the first thing one should do when one starts practicing is you should play whatever the hell you feel like playing. Uh, whatever you, whatever you, you feel like you want to do. Uh, it can be a piece you're working on, it can be an old piece, it can be sight reading something. Because uh, that makes you want to come to the piano. And then that starts warming up and then you start to shift over to what you're supposed to, supposed to to be doing. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, look, that's true. I think, I think there's no one formula that fits all, you know, the whole idea that you must do right. an hour of scales. I mean, it's kind of absurd. Uh, I was subject yeah. to, to sort of these regulations as, as a young, very young student. Yeah. And I, frankly, I never quite followed them because uh, it just made yeah. me. Not I was too. Good, you know? <laughs> um, Maybe at a young age, it's good, I don't know. Well, some, some, some people really don't mind following and some, some even enjoy it, you know. But for me, that was like, right. I really hated scales. I do kind of like them now uh, because I find right. it to be an evenness. But, but it, I, I think when I was younger, I just wanted uh, to play something, you know, dramatic and impressive and playing scales seemed like a waste of time. Um, right. It's all a matter of perception, right? Um, Yes. An important question, I, I, I'm curious uh, how you're dealing with performance anxiety. Do you have any? Ah, yeah, uh, that's a long discussion. Uh, for me, I think there are two things. Uh, one is performing is a little bit like a muscle and that the more you do it, uh, the better you get at it. Uh, and so... I always encourage my students, not always with success, to just drag yourself up there in as many rep classes as possible and play something. It doesn't matter what, you know, I mean, and, and you want to play decently well, you know, something that, you know, is, is presentable. Uh, and you may be nervous as hell playing in front of your classmates, you know, sometimes that's even more nerve wracking than playing, you know, a, a recital. Uh, but the more you, drag yourself up there or just, you know, pull a friend into the practice room and say, here, listen to this piece. And you play through a piece for a friend. Uh, and see, when I was young, the teacher I had at the time uh, had these monthly class recitals, which you call workshops. So everybody had to play once a month. And then we also, everybody had to play a recital once a year. Uh, and so I got used to performing uh, and that, has always helped me, you know, from a young age. That's one thing. The next thing is philosophical, uh, you might say. Uh, and what, what one should aim for in performing and what, it, what it's all about and not what it's not all about. <laughs> uh, and I think for me, a performance is best when it's at, at its most creative, spon spontaneous. Uh, and so, believe, you know, I, when I go on stage and play a piece, no matter how well I think I know it, I want to have the feeling that I'm making it up on the spot, that it's, you know, it's a world premiere. Nobody's ever heard this piece before. I never played it before. And it's being created anew, okay? And with that approach, it, it's more fun, okay? It's not like, you know, gymnastics, let's say, where you have to go through these hurdles uh, and you have to do this thing correctly and that thing correctly and that thing, and I got to remember to do this and I got to remember to do that, you know. That's, that's not what, what it's all about. And so I like to have this feeling, yeah, that, that uh, I'm going to be more inspired because it's more exciting as a performance, people are listening and, and, uh, and that energy leads to greater creativity and greater inspiration. Uh, and that's what can make performing fun instead of scary. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, they say um, it, it, and, it, uh, 
more about the content of what you do versus that you are doing it, uh, that it helps yeah. refocus sort right. of your attention. Yeah, and it's all yeah, getting to the essence of the music rather than a, a series of rehearsed details. <laughs> Very well, uh, and it, yeah, and I learned this really listening to. Edwin Fisher and Kurt Wengler and people like this. Uh, there was this sense of music being made on the spot, you know. Uh, and and uh, and so yeah, I, I think if students can try to look at it as as a an opportunity to be creative, uh, and actually, I mean, everybody has their own rigmarole before performing. Uh, I like to not look at the piece I'm playing the day I play it, uh, not even very much maybe the day before. Uh, I'll maybe try a few passages very slowly, but I like to have this feeling of a blank slate, as I say, so that then the music starts and let, let's see what happens. <laughs> okay. You have to feel really well prepared uh, for that. Yeah, and, what, yeah it's, it, in a way, and in a way it's, a, it, Maybe it presupposes a different kind of learning. It's not drilling. I mean, you have to do some of that, but it's more getting to the, the trying to get to the essence of the matter and figuring out the purpose of each note of each phrase of each section of each piece. Uh, and now the other thing, of course, is that the reason why we get nervous or whatever is because obviously the stakes are higher but that's because yeah i mean performing is really more of the real deal than playing in the practice room because uh, this is where it's you know what it's meant to be <laughs> and so like yeah and so it, that excitement of performing i think can be channeled in a way that can be inspiring and liberating rather than uh, crushing. Now that's it. There are certain people just but by nature who just get terrified and can never get over that and that's understandable. But I think hopefully for many people the combination of doing it a lot and having the right outlook and of course not worrying about uh, whether a few things don't go perfectly well. You know, not every passage is, is perfectly well. It's not a CD. <laughs> you know, and and furthermore, if one knows how a piece of music that you're performing is put together well enough, you won't have any disastrous memory slips. Uh, I will very often have lots of tiny memory slips. You know, the first time the chord has a third and then the second time it doesn't and then I switch it around, you know, stuff like that, you know. But if you know how the piece is put together, uh, you know, you won't get lost. And if the finger stumble with you, you can not get too far off. I completely agree. I always say music is a 3D environment. And, and, and if you know it structurally, then you know the 3D environment you're in. It's like knowing where the door handle is. You just reach for it and it's there. If you think 2D and you only rely on muscle memory, then one wrong fingering and you're derailed and you have no idea where you are. Right. Yeah, or it's like, I uh, like to give the, the analogy of a map. Like if you live in Manhattan and you know that this, the streets go up by number and the avenues go, you know, left, right by number. If you know the basic grid, you can't get lost, right? You might turn wrong or something, you might, but you'll, you'll end up getting where you need to go because you know how it's put together. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And now as we're getting towards uh, the final moments of our chat, uh, I love asking questions completely unrelated to uh, uh, necessarily music. Uh, what's your favorite book? Oh boy. Uh, uh, I assume you mean probably a non a, a fiction a favorite novel. Oh, well, anything. Uh, uh, Let's see. Well, one of my, I guess one of my favorite novels probably is uh, uh, Karamazov Brothers. I read it twice, and uh, it's just really incredible. 
It's a great uh, one. Yeah. Um, so that might be up there. Uh, and one I read recently, which was really incredible, was called The Wall uh, by John Hersey. It's about the, the Warsaw Ghetto and the Warsaw Uprising. Right. Uh, it's a kind of fictionalized real account of, of what happened. Uh, but it's incredibly well written. Uh, so anyway, um, and then there are some books of music on music that have, I learned a lot from, uh, actually some of Brendel's books I learned a tremendous amount from. Uh, and some of Fort Fengler's writings, some of it is very turgid, but some of the things that aren't <laughs> have inspired me uh, quite a bit. Uh, so, um, yeah, so I don't guess those are, those are a few. <laughs> what, what is your, uh, hobby? What do you do that is surprising and that has nothing to do with music or performing arts? Uh, well, there's this game called Scrabble, uh, that, uh, I absolutely love and am uh, smitten by and but it's just you know anagrams and word play and word games and things like that uh, you got quite good at it uh, I was hoping you'd mention it <laughs> yeah and so I uh, I mean I'm I appear good to a novice player but in the Scrabble world I'm very mediocre uh, I have a, uh, a friend actually who lives here in Cleveland Heights uh, who's a retired Musicologist, his name is Joel Wapnick. He used to teach at McGill in Toronto, and he's a world champion Scrabble player. And uh, when I play him, I realize how mediocre <laughs> I, I am. Uh, oh, don't you have a rank in the state of Ohio? Uh, I'm in maybe the top 10 or 20, That's uh, something like that. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I, mean, I have a rating, I'm right around the 1300 mark. Uh, no, I'm sorry, right around the 1400 mark. Uh, That's remarkable. Close to it. I'm trying to break it if and you have to know what that means. But, uh, you know, the top player is around 2000 and the novices are 900 or 1000. So, but, you know, I've, I've memorized list of words and anagrams and all this kind of thing. And I love playing Scrabble and it, uh, just somehow anagrams and words, totally not music. I mean, although there, maybe there is a connection. Uh, a big variation. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. And carnival, all, the, all of that yeah. back and forth. Right up the uh, alley. Yeah. Well, and food is the other big enjoyed, thing. Right. Uh, then you might have enjoyed the Da Vinci's Code. Because it's all about Maybe, that. yeah. I never, I never read that. <laughs> well, it's all, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the detective story, but it's all about anagrams and, and, and symbology and, and words. And, and, and I see. Okay. Um, okay. And then finally, uh, three questions. What would you say yes. to music students? And what would you say to a parent of a music student? And what would you say to a music teacher? Oh boy. Well, it depends on the student that it depends on the teacher. Well, it's uh, a generalization, but generally. Yeah, yeah, I know. Maybe I would say uh, learning music is a long road, it takes a lot of time, it is continually fulfilling, uh, and the activity of reaching for the highest art in and of itself is worthwhile. Ex 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 extrinsic from competitions or whatever, I'll just the, the act of pursuing music to its highest, deepest level is in, its, in and of itself worthwhile. Uh, for teachers, uh, I would say one should avoid methods. <laughs> Systems. Uh, I like to try to think that I, I don't have any system the way I teach. I just react to what I hear and I listen to what I hear and I just try to react. Mm -hmm. uh, the minute one tries to figure out a, a system, uh, then 
uh, then some, you know, something gets diminished. For parents, uh, I would say, let your kid, let your kid do what your kid wants to do, and don't interfere too much. <laughs> That's very good. Be, be encouraging, uh, and uh, uh, realize that it's you know it's not always lucrative. Uh, the right kind of learning doesn't always involve immediate satisfaction through competitions, uh, winning competitions or whatever. Uh, and it's hard enough being a musician. Uh, so pressure or discouragement from the parents is, is makes it all the worse. <laughs> and maybe, well, also for, I guess this is for students and parents, expose yourself if you're a student or your kid if you're a parent to non-piano music, everything outside of your piano. Listen to the get to know all the literature, the Beethoven symphonies, the Brahms symphonies, the string quartets, the operas, the leader, all this, have a broad horizon uh, and learn about great artists, great novelists, you know, have a broad horizon. So Those there are, deep, are some generals. Yeah, <laughs> very wise words. I, I couldn't agree more than just <laughs> the, amen. This is exactly <laughs> what I believe in as well. Uh, thank you so much for spending time with me and sharing. Thank you. It was fun. I, I mean, I could, we could talk for hours and hours. And I, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a pleasure. I, I, don't like, I don't like lecturing about music, but I love talking about it. <laughs> That's what this is all about, the creative by Constantine. Yes. Thank you so much, Daniel. Yeah. Stay thank safe. you for doing this whole project. And uh, I'm honored to be among the people that you have conversed with. <laughs> uh, it's my pleasure. The honor is all mine. Thank you.